Here's Warren Sprouse here on the Bible Forum. It is Easter weekend. This is Passover, Palm Sunday. This is the, the Sunday before the Sunday. I wanted to t- share a little bit with you about the implications relative to this thing that Israel calls Passover and we refer to as Palm Sunday. Recently in, in Israel, uh, a logo was unveiled, a logo that's to be used in the upcoming celebrations marking the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem under Israeli authority. The emblem features an Israeli flag flying atop the old city walls in the Temple Mount and is accompanied by the slogan, 50 years since the liberation of Jerusalem. The designer said her insistence on using the word liberation and not reunification in in the design sought to counter efforts to distort the Jewish connection with Jerusalem. Thousands of years of connection. She also stressed that part of the image featured uh, an Israeli flag that has returned to fly above the old city walls, the western wall, the Temple Mount. What's the significance in all of that? Well, the significance is God's eternal plan and purpose, both for Israel and for mankind, that God is honoring his promise to Israel, and that God has not abandoned anything nor anyone to whom he is committed. The pivotal part of this commitment is celebrated each year in Israel and throughout Christendom as Passover and as Palm Sunday and Easter, the Holy Week, that this remembrance and celebration are clouded by traditions and paganism is largely ignored. Not by Israel, but by most people, including Christians. And ends up a source of confusion and sometimes spiritual destruction. Israel just doesn't get it. She is largely officially still awaiting her Messiah. The various feasts, sacrifices, and rituals all point to the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't get that, being still blinded spiritually. They are blinded by God. There are some who are not. There is a remnant even among Israel. But God has set them aside for this time period, and he is working through the church. One day that will end. And once again, God will turn his attention to Israel. Those of us who are called Christians are often seriously confused. And the more so as time goes on. If you are truly a Christian, meaning one who is born again of the Spirit of God, you actually have been transformed on the inside by what is called salvation that transition from spiritual death wherein you lived to spiritual life wherein is hope and joy and meaningfulness. A transition that cleanses your heart of sin and corruption. A transition that opens your heart and your eyes to receive the truth of God's Word. A transition that brings the holy God of this universe to come and to live in you, motivating you, empowering you to think right, do right, be right in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of the world. If you are one who considers yourself a Christian because you're not Jewish or you're not pagan or because you belong to a church, you really may not understand anything I've just said. And the reason is because Christianity is not a cultural thing. We've made it so, but it's not. It's a spiritual thing. This week, folks all over the world went to church on Friday. They called it Good Friday. They went to remember the day Jesus died. That he did not die on a Friday isn't the issue for most folks only that we remember it so as to get some quality time off from work, meaning, to some at least, that it gives us a long weekend. 
The folks all over the world had their foreheads smeared with the ashes from burned palm fronds, in most cases those that had been blessed and dedicated to this purpose by priests. Again, not a very Christian kind of thing. Folks all over the world are breaking their 40-day fast called Lent, a fast which began the day after Fat Tuesday. We've talked about that. The day Mardi Gras ends, and every lascivious behavior, moral and physical excess known to man is acted out before these so-called Christians begin observing a fast, which means only limiting yourself in certain chosen areas. Fat Tuesday, let it all hang out, because from now till Eastern, you've got to act like you're under control. And they do all of this for Jesus. No. You see, Lent is not a, a Christian thing. Lent is actually a pagan thing. Revel for two weeks in all sorts of licentious, licentiousness, lewd behaviors, then renounce yourself by denying yourself what something that you like what does that mean well it means you pick something that you probably don't like anyway and you purpose not to have any of it for the next 40 days and i say that because i've known a lot of you i've known people who have done this all of their lives and that's what they do alongside of them are sincere people who take this stuff seriously. They look forward to being in church on Easter Sunday, a day which takes its name not from Christ, not from salvation or anything like that, but rather from the pagan goddess Ishtar. Why would we do that? Well, I won't get tangled up in the fact that none of this is Bible, that much of it's pagan, that most of us really don't care. Suffice it to say that ashes smudged on your foreheads to ward off evil spirits, a 40-day observance weeping for Tammuz, the murdered son of Nimrod, or perhaps Nimrod himself, and the term Easter taken from the pagan deity Ishtar are not Bible ideas but rather are brought over into a pseudo-Christian system to make people feel good, to give them something to do, to assuage their guilt, which is largely what Christianity has become. None of this does anything near the stated goal, that of salvation or of godly living. But the word Easter is in the Bible. Now, it may or may not refer to a celebration of Christ's resurrection. The reference was clearly Roman. Herod's plan to bring Paul to trial, the Bible says in Acts 12.4, was after Easter. I'm of the opinion that the King James translators put that in. When you go back to the original, it, it's not that clear. But the day in question, the only thing that the Romans knew at that time would have been a pagan celebration. But it may have been that they were actually talking about Passover, knowing the Jews held this in honor and they waited till it was over. But we human beings love our rituals and our traditions and we don't get tangled up in all of that stuff. I want to look at how all these ancient events come together. We're largely ignorant, you know and thereby confused about the differences and the similarities between Christianity and Judaism, not to mention the proliferation of secular churchianity. Part of our problem is harmonizing all these things. We have even lost the definition of Christian along with the why of it all. So here are some facts. There was no Judaism before Moses. There was no Christianity 
before Pentecost. So what did all these people do before Moses gave them the law? And where did the law go after Pentecost? In answering these questions, we'll talk about Passion Week and how all that fits in. You see, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve with one limitation. Don't eat that fruit. The necessity was to impress upon them the fact that they were not in charge. God was saying, this is my garden. I give it to you to tend. You are my stewards. It was a simple, non-threatening test. The question was, do you love me more than you love anything or anyone else, including yourself? Are my standards important to you? And the obvious answer came back, no. Now, the Bible is careful to tell us that Eve was completely deceived. She didn't do anything deliberately, although she was staring at it and thinking about it and all that. But the actual transaction, she got tricked. But nowhere in Scripture are we told that she deliberately sinned against God. Adam, on the other hand, did. He's the head of that relationship, of the race. He was rebellious. He deliberately defied God in eating of that fruit. And in so doing, he transfers his stewardship to Satan. You say, well, I never read that anywhere. Well, you have to read about that in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, where God gives us a principle. Paul wrote, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness he yielded to satan and became the servant of satan and the stewardship satan began to exercise as a result everything in this world is corrupted these two people must leave the garden because it belongs to God. They must eke out a living from the soil by the sweat of your brow. And they apparently began offering sacrifices to God as worship and atonement. Keep in mind the word atonement means covering something up. There's no atonement in Christianity. Later Cain and Abel would follow that pattern. The acceptable sacrifice would be innocent blood, apparently the blood of an innocent lamb, something Cain would rather die than do. In these boys, first descendants of the now corrupted Adam and Eve, we see the eternal dichotomy between the righteous and the profane. In the following narrative, it's clear that only one family of mankind, those descendants of Seth, would honor God, while everyone else did what was right in his own eyes eyes. Genesis chapter 4 verse 6 or verse 26 and to Seth to whom also there was born a son and he called his name Enos then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. For the next thousand years or so men multiply upon the earth. It is the children of Cain which create the human, natural, physical things of which the earth consists today. These rebels built cities. God never told anybody to build a city. They were farmers. They were sheep herders, living off the land, trusting God. These people built cities. They were the instigators, the developers of metallurgy, of music, of bricks and mortar with which to build these large buildings. They were also the progenitors of polygamy, divorce, manslaughter, all of which are products of those who do not love God. You say music is the product of the... No, there's music in heaven. But the music down here has always been designed to touch your soul. 
and it's a two-edged sword. I love music. Music resonates with the immaterial part of our being. It moves us, it shapes us, it drives us. And men who do not love God with their whole being create music with which they worship their lusts. Melancholy music, marching music, romantic music, chaotic music, music by which they lose control of their senses. Today, the new worship music is more rhythm and blues than it is sacred. It's more rock and roll than it is spiritually moving or instructive. And the people love it so. All sorts of people. Because it resonates with our sensuality, with our basic senses. Take the contemporary music out of our church services today and find out how many people show up tomorrow. See, they're not there to meet and to do business with God. Some, perhaps. But the vast majority, majority simply tolerate the music if they're there to worship God. But if they stay in that environment, eventually it changes their soul focus. Now I know I'm going to get rude comments for saying stuff like this. But as you sit down and write these rude comments, these criticisms, realize all you're doing is proving the point. Just keep in mind, none of these things we enjoy about this world were devised by the godly line of Adam through Seth. For the next thousand years or so, men went about the business of making their world into their own likeness. In the end, Nimrod put it all together and created a universal religion that was anti-God. A religious system that still exists today. Segments all over the world. A religious system that moved God to destroy all that breathed from off the earth saved eight souls. A religious system that moved God to judge mankind, and it still exists. The flood in Noah's day resulted from the breaking up of the earth's mantle, exploding dirt and water into the air. It involved breaking the vapor uh, layer above the earth that shielded the sun's harmful rays. Can you say ozone? The cataclysmic upheaval changed the topography and the attitude and rotation of the earth. Science tells us the earth has, was not always tilted as it is now, and that something catastrophic occurred in its history and shifted it. That's why we have seasons. Creating a world that would be ravaged by animals, weather, disease, and mankind, and shortening our lives as a result. In a very short period of time after the flood, men were back worshiping their own imaginations. The ancient religion of Babel brought another of God's judgments. Language was confounded. People divided according to language, the ones they could understand, and they gathered together and then dispersed around the globe. Babel was reproduced throughout the world, albeit in a weakened and corrupted form. Everywhere man has looked, he has found vestiges of Babel worship. From the gods and the goddesses to the burial mounds in Europe to pyramid-like constructs in South America to the actual pyramids, all of which served as focal points in pagan worship schemes. In South America and perhaps other places, they were places where young male adults had their hearts ripped out while they were still beating in sacrifice to their gods. In all of this, men have sought to dominate their fellow man, creating great civilizations with great capital cities and great wealth. When the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, they were not slaves to Egyptians. Archaeology tells us that for centuries this issue was disputed. The Bible says one thing and archaeology say Egyptians would never do that. They would never elevate this Hebrew to a place of, of honor in their society. And a while back, 100 years, I don't know what, 50 years? No, I'm getting older. 100 years. <laughs> 
they discovered that these were Hiskos people from the northern Mediterranean area that dominated and ruled in Egypt in the days of Moses, a people group who ruled for about 500 years and then suddenly disappeared. Where'd they go? Well, the Bible says their monarch and their army were drowned in the sea. And it's possible that native Egyptians then took back their land. God setting up this event just for himself so that Moses could rise to this place. And out of all of that, God was calling and equipping a people, sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hebrews, the nation of Israel. To this one human family, God gave law, a complex, comprehensive set of rules by which to live involving diet and dress and social customs, sacrifice, finances, rules of all sorts. To honor God, the Jew must obey these rules. To reject these rules meant judgment. God either striking them dead, crops that did not yield a harvest from locust or sun or whatever, defeat at the hands of their enemies and, and more. The uneducated and the uninitiated are prone to view the law as a means by which a Jew would get to heaven. Jews themselves also began to see it that way. But it's not true. No one ever got to heaven by being good. Why? Because no human being can be good as God defines good. The law of Moses regulated life and worship prescribed the way to honor God, to serve God. It did not provide a way to God. The way to God has always been by God's grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. From the days of Adam, through Noah, Abram, Jacob, Moses, it was ever so. The centurion the Roman soldier who sent friends to Jesus that he might heal his servant. Jesus said he had faith, faith that Jesus had not seen in all of Israel, Luke 7, 9. And the point here? These are Jews who kept the law, trusting God, believing God, and in so doing they saw themselves being judged as righteous. But if they were righteous in the sight of God, it wasn't because they kept the law. It was because they had faith in God and thereby kept the law. They believed God and therefore kept the law. Those Jews who did not keep the law with sincerity, with consistency, were not righteous, regardless of how much they did. Paul summed it up in Romans chapter 3. He says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfaction through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. So where's the boasting? It is excluded. By what? By a law? By works? No. It is excluded by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Or is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, Jews, by faith, and uncircumcision, Gentiles, by faith. What the Jew was doing from Moses to Christ was establishing some basic principles that served to maintain the people group from which Messiah would come and, and then create the basic structure upon which Messiah would build. And all of this was vital to God's program that it took 4,000 years might encourage you to understand that God is not in a hurry. What Christians observe on Easter 
is nothing less than what Jesus did in the garden for Adam and Eve in sacrificing innocent blood to cover their sin. His sacrifice is much more far-reaching and comprehensive, but the issue is still the same. Innocent blood for sinful man. Not the works you do, the prayers you pray, the churches you join, but whether or not you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 